Hey everyone, and welcome back for another deep dive. This time, we're taking a look at a brand new research paper all about automated market making in the crypto space. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, straight from the labs of Cornell Financial Engineering Manhattan. Hot off the press. Super cutting edge. So picture this, algorithms trading crypto 24 seven, but not in a, you know, Wall Street kind of way. Right, right. We're talking about algorithms that focus on providing liquidity and managing risk. Exactly. And, you know, whether you're already a crypto trader or just curious about how things work behind the scenes, mm -hmm. understanding market making is key. So that's what we're diving into today. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Yeah, the researchers really went deep on this one, focusing specifically on perpetual contracts. And just to clarify, those are like futures contracts, but without an expiration date. Oh, OK. I see. So traders can basically bet on the future price of a cryptocurrency without actually owning the asset itself. Interesting. So I noticed they narrowed their focus to the top 30 cryptocurrencies by market cap. Any particular reason for that? Yeah, they wanted to make sure they were working with assets that had high liquidity, you know, lots of buyers and sellers ready to trade. That's super important for market makers because it means they can execute trades quickly and efficiently without causing those big price swings. Makes sense. So basically, they focused on the big players, the ones that really drive the market. And I also noticed that they grouped those 30 cryptocurrencies into different categories. Yeah, they did. They had layer one protocols meme coins, which coins in there, and also DeFi tokens. It's a way to kind of understand their behavior patterns and how they interact within their groups. You know, like you wouldn't expect a lion to behave the same way as a dolphin, right? Right, right. So understanding those characteristics of each category helps with developing effective strategies and managing risk. Makes sense. So let's get into the nitty gritty of the data. I see they use candlestick data for their research. Why not go for the more detailed order book data? Well, candlestick data gives you a good snapshot of price action over a specific time frame. Okay. You see the opening price, the high, the low, and the closing price. It's a good balance. Not as detailed as order book data, which shows you every single buy and sell order. But it's perfect for their research, especially when using the HummingBot platform. Ah, yeah. HummingBot, that's a powerful platform for building and testing these trading algorithms. Exactly. It's like choosing a clear map over a super detailed satellite image. Right, right. Both show you the landscape, but sometimes the map is easier to work with. That's a good analogy. Yeah. And with this research, we're talking a massive data set, right? Huge. One minute candlestick data for 30 cryptos over 45 days. That's from September 1st to October 14th of last year. So over 60,000 data points per cryptocurrency a really robust set of data for testing their algorithms. Now let's talk about the core of this research, the pure market making or PMM strategy. Right. They explored two different types, PMM simple and PMM dynamic. Can you break down the difference for us? Sure. So both strategies revolve around placing buy and sell orders around a reference price. And the goal is to profit from the spread between those orders. Simple PMM keeps that spread fixed, while dynamic PMM adjusts the spread based on market volatility. I see. So dynamic PMM is a bit more reactive, kind of like a street vendor adjusting prices on the fly, depending on foot traffic. Now, in their back testing, they played around with some key parameters, things like stop loss cooldown time and executor refresh time. What were they trying to figure out there? They were looking for the optimal ranges for these parameters, the sweet spots that would make the algorithms perform their best. For example, with the simple strategy, they found that a stop loss cooldown time between eight and nine minutes was the most effective. Interesting. So why that specific range? Anything shorter and the algorithm would exit positions too quickly, too long, and it would react too slowly to sudden price drops. Ah, so it's all about finding that Goldilocks zone, not too fast, not too slow. Exactly. And what about the executor refresh time? 
they found that refreshing every three to five minutes was ideal. Striking that balance between being responsive to market changes and avoiding unnecessary adjustments. And these findings are actually super valuable for anyone who wants to fine tune their own automated trading strategies. It's all about those little tweaks. Mm -hmm. Now their back testing showed that the dynamic strategy, especially when using the MACD indicator, could be really effective. But here's where it gets even more interesting. They didn't stop there. They went on to develop their own signals. That's right. They were looking for indicators that could predict price movements even better, trying to give their algorithms an extra edge, you know? Like they were market detectives searching for hidden clues. So tell me about one of their most intriguing discoveries, the bar portion signal. Okay, so the bar portion signal it sounds complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward. It basically measures the proportion of price change within a candlestick. Okay, so if a big price swing happens right at the beginning or end of that candlestick's time frame, that would be a high bar portion. Precisely. And here's the cool part. A high bar portion often signals a reversal in the next time period. So it's like stretching a rubber band. The further you pull it in one direction, the more likely it is to snap back the other way. Exactly. That bar portion signal gives the algorithm a glimpse into future price action, which helps it make better trading decisions. It's like being one step ahead. Wow, now I see how powerful that could be, anticipating those mini reversals in the market. Buy low, sell high, all within minutes. It's like riding those price swings like a surfer. That's the idea. But even with sophisticated signals, managing risk is still crucial, especially in the crypto market. How do the researchers tackle that? They use something called the triple barrier, Essentially, it's a safety net with three layers, a stop loss, a take profit, and a time barrier. Like a three-pronged shield protecting the algorithm from disaster. Mm. So how do those barriers work? Well, the stop loss limits potential losses. It automatically closes a position if the price drops below a certain level. Okay, so it cuts your losses. Yep. The take profit does the opposite, locking in profits when the price reaches your target. And finally, the time barrier makes sure no position stays open indefinitely. Interesting. So no matter how well a trade is doing, it'll close after a certain time. Exactly. And what's really smart is that the researchers actually calibrated these barriers differently for each cryptocurrency, taking into account their volatility and liquidity. So a meme coin like Dogecoin might have different barriers than a stable coin like Tether. Precisely. They tailored those barriers to the unique characteristics of each coin. So that's the theory behind these strategies. But the real test came when they took their algorithms from simulation into the real world. And that's where things get really interesting. So let's dive into those results. They picked three trading pairs, SOL USDT, Doge USDT, and Gala USDT. And they let those algorithms loose in the real market for a full 24 hours. See how they perform under pressure. Yeah, real trial by fire. Exactly. And they compared those live trading results to the back testing they had done. Right. And you know what's interesting? The live trading actually often outperformed the back testing results. Really? Yeah, even though the trading volumes were actually lower in the live environment. Hmm. That's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But remember, backtesting is kind of like practicing for a big game in a very controlled environment. Right. But the real game always throws you curveballs. Oh, of course. In this case, the researchers, they were pretty conservative with their backtesting, especially when it came to estimating trading costs. And in the real world, those costs turned out to be lower, which led to higher profits. So now let's get to the head-to-head -head competition between the two PMM strategies, dynamic versus BP. Yeah. Dynamic using that traditional SED indicator and BP, leveraging the researcher's fancy new bar portion signal. Right. Did the bar portion prove its worth? Well, let's see. Starting with SOL USDT. Okay. PMM BP took the crown there. Really? Yeah. It generated a decent profit while PMM Dynamic actually ended up with a loss. Wow. So for SOL, at least that quest for a better signal really paid off. It did. Not only did PMMBP make money, but it did it with way less trading activity. Right. Less trading, less fees. Yeah. Efficiency is key. Especially in crypto. Okay. So what about everybody's favorite Dogecoin, Doge USDT? Oh, on Doge USDT, it was basically a tie. A tie. Yeah. Both strategies generated pretty similar profits, although PMMBP did achieve its profit with less trading volume once again. Interesting. So maybe for a meme coin like Dogecoin with all its, you know, volatility and unpredictability, the bar portion signal doesn't offer as much of an advantage. Yeah, it's like trying to predict the whims of a Shiba Inu. <laughs> totally. And now for the elephant in the room, 
game like USDT. This is where things went a little sideways, right? Yeah, both strategies took a bit of a hit there. What happened? Was it just bad luck or? Well, during that 24 hour trading period, Gala's price was all over the place. Really? Sharp spikes followed by gradual declines. Oof, that's tough. It was a really tricky environment to trade in. Yeah, like trying to catch a falling knife. Pretty much both algorithms struggled to keep up with those erratic movements. They entered short positions, you know, betting the price would go down. Yeah. And then bam, those sudden upward surges caught them off guard. It's a combination of bad timing and a really tough market. Yeah. But even in that chaos, PMM, BP consistently had lower losses compared to PMM dynamic. Okay, so a relative win for BP. Right, it's like two ships in a storm. One might be taking on more water, but they're both in a pretty bad spot. So the overall takeaway from this live trading experiment. I think it really highlights that even the smartest algorithms can't predict the future perfectly. Yeah. There will always be surprises, those market events, that can throw off even the best laid plans. Right, but it also shows just how powerful these algorithms can be. Oh, absolutely. PMMBP, with that bar portion signal, it held its own and even outperformed the traditional MACD in some cases. Yeah, it's a glimpse into the future of crypto trading. Yeah, algorithms aren't just about automating trades. Right. They can bring efficiency, manage risk. Unlock new levels of profit. And speaking of risk management, that triple barrier approach, yeah. that's huge, right? It is. It shows how we can design these algorithms with built-in safeguards to protect against those catastrophic losses we see in crypto sometimes. It's not just about making money. It's about staying in the game. So we've talked about optimizing trading strategies, but this research is about so much more than that. Right. It's really a window into how algorithms are changing the entire financial landscape. It's a paradigm shift. What are your thoughts on that bigger picture? Well, algorithms are playing a larger role in everything. Finance, portfolio management, loan approvals. Yeah, it's everywhere. And like with any big tech advancement, there are huge opportunities and challenges. Mm. And the key, I think, is finding that balance between innovation and responsibility. Right. We have to keep pushing those boundaries, but we also have to make sure this technology is used ethically. It really is amazing to see what's possible with algorithms in this space. We've seen how they can find those hidden patterns and even beat those traditional strategies in some cases. Where do you see this tech going in the future? It's going to be fascinating to watch this all evolve. As algorithms get even more sophisticated, I think we're going to see some really groundbreaking strategies emerge. Like imagine algorithms that are tailored to each individual trader, you know? Oh, wow. Personalized algorithms. Yeah, like an algorithm that learns from your past trades and adjusts its strategies based on your risk tolerance and goals. That would be incredible, like having a personal AI trading assistant. Well, this has been a fascinating look into the world of automated market making in crypto. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, everyone. It's been a pleasure exploring this with you. We'll be back soon with another deep dive into a cutting edge topic. Until then, keep learning, keep exploring, and keep those questions coming.